So guys, the, before I even have a chance to have breakfast, the fun is already starting. So, observer of life, uh, this person, I've run into this person a few times. They've actually commented a few times on my channel, uh, but not very much uh, that I can remember anyway. Um, but they've exposed themselves, so we're going to address this, and we're going to expose this the heresy that is being uh, propagated by this individual. Because they actually take credit for what I covered in the video, the one woman bride heresy. I don't know why they would be so arrogant to think that they're the ones that started all this, because they're not. Um, this is actually a very, very old doctrine. Very old. Um, and it's wrong. <laughs> Everything about it is wrong. And the Bible does not support it. Period. End of discussion. It doesn't support it. Uh, so we're going to address some of the issues this person talks about here, of which they do not quote a single scripture again. But we're going to help them out because we found the scriptures and we're going to cover it in this quick video. So here's the comment from Observer of Life. And this is the channel. They obviously don't bother to teach anybody anything except in comments behind the scenes trying to be slick. It's not going to do any good. However, I do like their statement here in their description. The problem with today's prophets is they are more than willing to make promises they are not responsible for keeping. It is a foolish mistake to make promises on someone else's behalf. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. You know that it refers to you too, right? Just saying. So let's go through this comment. Okay, so I, and I actually have another video I filmed about another individual that commented on this video also that I haven't posted yet. Okay, so I only made it six minutes in. There's your first mistake. You didn't watch the whole video. I know you didn't watch the whole video. I've only made it six minutes in because of the hardness of your, or harshness of your judgment towards those who don't believe like you. No. Wrong. Completely wrong. I don't care if she doesn't believe like me. I don't care if you don't believe like me. If you're wrong, you're wrong. If you look at a car and say the car is green and somebody else comes up and says, no, it's yellow. And you look at the paint code and the paint code says it's yellow. The car's yellow. You can believe all you want, and I can tell you you're wrong all I want, because you're wrong. The facts prove that. It has nothing to do with whether they believe like me or not. They're wrong. This is what the Bible teaches. And it also says we are to call these things out. We're going to cover this. It really is not necessary to call others stupid. Look, you have to understand what the term stupid really means, what the actual definition of the word means. When I use those words, I don't use them in a derogatory sense. I use them in their literal meaning. I never use these words in a derogatory way. Stupid. Adjective. Having or showing a great lack of intelligence or common sense. In a noun form, it says a stupid person often used as a term of address. I'm using it in its adjective definition. Showing a great lack of intelligence or common sense. So, if you use stupid in a derogatory sense, don't project that onto me. I'm, that's not how I use these words. Look up the definition, get educated. Um, it does no good for you or them. Actually, it might wake them up out of stupor because the Bible says make a difference or make a, make a, making a distinction between some saved with compassion, some pulled out of the fire. You all need to be pulled out of the fire. I totally get where you're coming from. No, you don't because as we see in your comment, as we'll read, you don't get where I'm coming from at all because you agree with this person. Please don't think I don't or that I'm here to attack you or discredit you in any way. Well, that's exactly what you do in your comment, though. I just want to try to help you see this perspective from a less over-spiritualized point of view. So we're supposed to see it from a carnal point of view? Is that what you're saying? Because the Bible says not carnality, Christ. So you're already... Both feet in the hole. You've already completely missed the mark. So I'm just going to address a few points you made, if you don't mind. First of all, you said that Jesus said, in his own words, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. This was a letter, and I did say that, this was a letter from Paul to the Galatians. Jesus never said this. Wrong. Stop right there. Galatians... 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
Jesus did say that because where do you think Paul got it from? Paul didn't come up with this on his own. Paul spoke on behalf of Christ through the Holy Spirit, being taught by the Holy Spirit. Him actually being directly taught by Christ one-on-one. -on -one. Where do you think Paul got that from? From Jesus. These guys didn't speak on their own authority or on their own behalf. They admit that in the scriptures. So Jesus Christ said this to Paul, and Paul is repeating it. That's where he got this from. So yes, Christ did say that. You just don't see it in the scriptures because your view of the scripture is right here. And you need to look at it, the whole big picture. I hate that term, but you got to look at the big picture. What's actually going on here? Context is everything. Context is everything. So yes, Christ did say this. And there's actually another scripture that links to this. In Matthew 22, 30, Matthew 22, 30, Jesus himself said, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So what you're proposing is this one bride, this one woman is exempt and separate from everyone else. Okay, then why do so many women think they're that person? If the one bride is a special individual set aside for Christ, she should know exactly who she is, and nobody else should be making claim to that title. Then why are there literally hundreds of thousands of women in the world attaining to that title? There's a problem with this doctrine. Mainly is it doesn't match the Bible, but it also allows for a whole lot of carnality, which the Bible says you're not to be involved in, as car in anything carnal. We're supposed to de deny the carnal and move away and go into spirituality. You said in a less spiritual sense, then it's wrong. Because we're supposed to walk in the Spirit. Our understanding is supposed to be based and come from the Spirit. So you're already, you're, you're completely buried in the hole already. But we're not done. Because it goes more. So he says, Jesus himself says quite clearly, they're not going to get married. Jesus in Matthew 22, 30, is making the assertion of what Paul made in Galatians. So, again, Jesus did say it. He didn't say it in those exact words, but it's pretty easy to tell what's going on here because those two verses connect. And again, where did Paul get it? From Jesus. Now, we can also go to Mark 12, 25. Jesus says, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. He also says in Mark 12, 24, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? You're in grave error here, sir, or ma'am, whatever you are. You're in grave error. And you don't know the scriptures. That's why you're coming up with a carnal understanding. That's where all this false doctrine comes from, is a carnal understanding. And this is dangerous. This is why I'm fighting against this. It's wrong. It is not part of the Bible at all. So you say in this, and I believe that if you think a little harder about whoops, what you, what you yourself said, you will see that it would be possible for Jesus to have an actual physical relationship with a woman. No. Listen, Christ is the first fruits. If Christ said in Matthew and Mark, they're not going to be male or female, but Paul says later, we're going to be like Christ. If Christ is male, then we're going to be male like him, right? If we're like Christ. But evidently we're not, are we? Because Christ isn't male or female. He has the personage of male. He exudes the personality of male. We're not going to be male and female, but we're going to be like him. So that means he's not male either. We're a new creation that has never existed before. See, if you know the scriptures, you know that. If he can truly exist in both places. Yes, he can truly exist in both places. You almost sound like you don't believe that. He is not going to have a physical relationship with a woman. It's not going to happen. There's no need for it. Spiritual beings don't do that. Please consider this. Please just consider this. I have, and it's wrong. If God has made it possible for Jesus to exist in both places, why don't we believe he could or would have the intention of doing that? Wait, wait, what? Hold on a second. I missed this one. If God has made it possible for Jesus to exist in both places, why don't we believe he could or would have the intention of doing that for us too? Doing what for us? Too? Having sex with a woman? We're not going to do it. He said we're not going to be male or female. In order to ha have a sexual interaction, you have to have a male or female. Hello. 
Or are you one of those other people? They are not male or female. We will not be male or female. The Bible says we will be known as we were when we become the new creation. We're going to look like we used to be. We're going to be something completely different, something that's never existed on this earth. Something that the prophets and the angels sought to learn more about because they didn't understand it. I've covered this. It's all over the Bible. So you don't know your scriptures, sir. You don't read your Bible. You came up with a carnal understanding and it satisfies your lustful desires of your flesh and you're projecting that onto other people. You're making a mistake. A huge mistake. Because you will have to answer for what you're teaching people. Stick to the scriptures. Now, regarding all that stuff she was saying about the bride being one woman and not the church, because he would not marry men, women, and children, I am the one who started all that. I'm glad you made that admission. You need to seriously consider repenting. Don't even consider it. You need to repent. Because you're teaching people something very wrong. You go on to say, and I can see the information has been a bit misconstrued over time, so I hope that you will allow me to clarify. Here's what's funny is, is I've read your whole comment, and I'm going to read it for the viewers. I read your whole comment. The problem is, you didn't clarify. You agree with her. You clarified what she said is what you taught. You're in a very dangerous place. You complain about other people speaking on God's behalf and making promises on his behalf, and yet you're doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm speaking what the Word says, what the Bible says. You read what the Bible says, that's what you go with. On the one hand, you admitted a wedding and feast is a feasible thing. It is feasible. It's very much feasible. Through stating, it hasn't happened yet. But then, you also stated that it was a joining together of the church in Christ. It is. It is a joining together. The head being joined together with the body. That's what the Bible clear, clearly says. Pause and think about that for a second. I don't need to. I go by what the scriptures say. If there is going to be a wedding and a feast because of a joining together, what is that? A marriage. No. It's not a feast the way we think it is. I mean, they've got people going around here thinking that, there's going to, that they would like to have a ribeye tree. That's a dumb thing to say. Because that is not what they're talking about. This that is happening in heaven is different from what we have here. We're not going to a barbecue in heaven. This feast is something completely different than what we think about. Will we be able to eat? Sure. Are we going to? Chances are pretty high. It's not going to be that kind of feast. It's going to be something else. Because a lot of that stuff is put in those terms so it's easy for us to grasp and understand. Spiritual beings don't need to eat. They, may, they might be able to because they're, Christ is physical and spiritual, but they don't need to. We're putting too much of our carnality into this. Because I'm telling you, as a matter of fact, the greatest thing on earth doesn't even hit the radar on the worst thing in heaven. Not even close. Because the lowest thing in heaven is beyond our comprehension. Heaven is way, way better than any of this down here. Um, there just is no two ways about it. Either there will actually be a marriage or there won't. There's not going to be. There, we're not all going to go and sit. The family of the bride are on this side. The family of the groom are on this side. And there's going to be a pastor standing up there in the front. And Jesus and his bride are going to be standing. There is not going to be a marriage like that. This is garbage teaching. It's garbage. Let's go to Jude 124 real quick. Y'all are killing me on this. Can't even read scripture. Jude one twenty four. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both for now and forever. Amen. That is not actually the one I was looking for. Uh, that is not the scripture I was looking for. Let's go here. Oh, yeah, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. That's what I was looking for. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. 
For I am jealous over you, jealous for you, with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Do you understand what he's talking about here? This is Paul. Do you understand what he's talking about here? I am jealous with you over a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Who is he talking to? Believers. The church. There is no one bride. The church is the bride. You all are dumb. Dumb not in the um, derogatory sense, dumb in the actual definition of the word. Because you're not looking at this from the proper standpoint that the Bible describes. Those descriptions are given to help us understand what it really is. But if we never get out of the carnal, which the Bible tells us to do, which you people like you are obviously not doing, you're never going to achieve the proper understanding. You're going to be, but Lord, we did these things in your name. No. Don't do that to yourself. Read the Bible. Read what it says. Paul says, I'm again, I'm going to re repeat this, and anybody listening that wants to be able to fight this argument with other people, write these scriptures down. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, Paul helps me out here a little bit because he goes on in the next verse, but I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's what's happening here, and this is why I'm fighting against this, because truth is worth standing up for. And this false doctrine has destroyed a lot of people's lives and caused a lot of people to go to hell. And a lot more are probably headed there because of it. And God help you if you're a teacher of this type of doctrine, which you, sir, are, obviously are. Verse 4 in 2 Corinthians 11, For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, which you're preaching, the Jesus that this doctrine preaches is not the Jesus of the Bible. It is a different Jesus. What purpose would it be for him to physically consummate a marriage with one woman? What purpose? Serves no purpose. He's on high, sitting on the throne next to the Father, do you think sex is one of the one of the things he's thinking about? No, not even close. That is not even close to the radar. Take yourself out of the scriptures. Stop teaching what you desire and making people believe like you believe. I'm trying to help people believe what the Bible says. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, none of the apostles ever preached what you're preaching, ever. None of the church fathers ever preached what you're preaching, ever. Or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, a false Holy Spirit, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. And that's what's happening. People have been given another Jesus that satisfies their lustful carnal desires of their flesh, and they accept him. That's not the real Jesus. That's not the real Jesus. Okay, Ooh, we're still a little bit further here. So you have to decide which one it is you believe. I have already decided that. I've decided what the Bible says. That's what I believe is what the Bible says. Because the truth about marriage is found in the Bible, yes. But not the marriage concerning Christ and the church. In the very beginning when God said, and the two shall become one, that's a man and a woman, which is a picture of, it is a shadow, and I'm going to prove you didn't watch the whole video because I'm going, to, I'm going to show you a scripture that discusses this. Not a group of people and Jesus shall become one. Marriage is a covenant between two people. This is how it was designed to be by the creator himself. It is a covenant that is literally sealed through consummation of the marriage. So that is what she was trying to say. So again, she was trying to say, like everybody else that believes this says, we're all going to be standing around the throne and Jesus and his wife are going to be right there on the, on, the, on the floor of heaven. Is that what you're saying? No. You're a liar. You are a liar. And it's disgusting that this is what people believe and that they what, what they project onto our God. You believe in another Jesus. You believe in another Jesus. Woe to you and all who believe like you because it's not what God designed. It's not what Christ is going to do. It's a lie. 
That if you honestly believe that Jesus is going to be joined together with the church, you are unwittingly believing that Jesus will also be consummating his union with all of those he was joined together with, with men, women, and children. You're saying that if I believe that Jesus and the Christ and the church are going to be brought together, head to, connected to the body, where the scriptures say that the head feeds it through joints and ligaments, feeds the body, that I'm unwittingly saying that Christ is going to have sex with men, women, and children? No, that's wrong. You're projecting your lustful desires onto me. Those are your desires, not mine. I'm not interested in that stuff. That's what you want. That's what you think. Because you said it. Christ is the head. The head, here's the head by itself. The church is the body. The marriage, the joining is going to be Christ and his body being brought back together to become one. See, again, there's the, where the word stupid comes in. You're lacking intelligence and common sense. You don't have to like it, but it's still the truth. I'm not afraid to call people out on it. This is important. You'll do it behind a keyboard. No, I'll do it, behind, I'll do it to your face. You're wrong. And the only person you're hurting is you and those who listen to you. Because you'll have to answer for that blood. Just telling you. No, that, that statement right there, this statement right here, that's what you believe. That's not what I believe. That's what you believe. That's your understanding. That's your lustful thoughts and your disgusting ideas. Not mine. Don't project yourself on me. And regarding the reincarnation thing, oh, here we go. Did you know that a lot of Jews actually believe in reincarnation? Yes, I do. Actually, reincarnation was a big thing. But that doesn't make it right. Still a lie. Reincarnation is not real. False doctrine propagates more false doctrine. It's a lie. There is no reincarnation. It's not biblical at all. I've covered this. So that to me says there might be a few difference, differences between the Torah, the actual Jewish scriptures, but there's two Torahs and what we have been given to read and interpret today. No. There's two Torahs. There's the Torah in the Bible. There's one of, or two of my Bibles there. A bunch more over there on the bookshelf. Wherever it's at now. I got seven, eight different Bibles in here. So, they have another Torah, also referred to as the Tanakh. Some people think it's actually more or closer, closer related to the Talmud, which is demonic at best, at, at worst. And your statement and what we have been given to read and interpret today, that there's a difference between them? So you think the Bible isn't accurately translated? All false doctrine bases in this deception. All false doctrine. You believe what you believe because you don't believe the Bible is accurate. Again, that makes you a liar. And your final statement is, do you believe all things are possible for God or not? Yes, but I also believe that there are some things he won't do because they're not necessary. I believe what his Bible says. So it's pretty clear by your statement, you don't believe the Bible is accurately translated. Duly noted, you're a heretic and a liar. You don't have to like that. You don't have to like that I'm calling you that. It's still the truth. It's still the truth. If I fall off a cliff and I hit the ground, I'm going to die. I don't like it. It's still going to happen. It's still the truth. See, this isn't about you. This isn't about these other women who are, are absolutely off their rocker. It's about God. It's about Christ. It's about his word and what he said. So we have to take the time to be adults and read the word so we know what we're talking about. Because if we're not willing to do that, we're making a massive mistake. Now, final scripture I'm going to go to, since you didn't watch the whole video which is clear you didn't watch the whole video, is I'm going to take you over to Ephesians 5, because if you did, you'd have seen this. Let's scroll down to number 22, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. If you're going to be submissive to the Lord, treat your husband, treat your husband the same way. Watch. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Christ is the head, church is the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be their, to their own husbands in everything. If the church isn't the bride of Christ, why is the church subject to Christ? Hmm. 
Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. You notice the first person referencing here? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Chaste virgin? Remember what Paul said? Where do you think Paul got that from? That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. You notice the speech here and what it's saying? So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Just as the Lord does the church. You notice that there's not a single reference to the bride of Christ being one woman in the Bible anywhere? But there are references to the church being the bride. For we are members of his body. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, and this is the scripture you quoted in the beginning of your comment, since you failed to put the references in there. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Which also means we as believers shall leave our families and friends and, and everything here, and go to Christ to become one flesh. You see, the marriage between a man and a woman here in the physical realm is a shadow or a picture of the joining of Christ and his church in the spiritual realm. This is a great mystery, as he's proving to the people. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So what he just spoke of was a man and a woman coming together, and he's speaking of Christ and the church coming together. There's your marriage. There's your marriage. See, none of you guys ever go to Ephesians 5 because Ephesians 5 proves you wrong clearly. Ephesians 5 blows your entire narrative out of the water. And I have yet in three years to get a single one of you to address Ephesians 5. Not a single one of you because you don't read your Bible. I can say that with confidence. You don't read your Bible because if you did, you'd see this and you would not get that understanding. See, nobody reading the Bible as it is gets that understanding. Nobody. A five-year-old, an eight-year-old, a ten-year-old, a twelve-year-old will read this and go, well, yeah, we're going to go be with Jesus. We're the bride. And Jesus told the apostles, unless you receive this as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom. We're not to overcomplicate what he gave us. We're to receive it as a ch child would receive it. We're to receive it as a child would receive it. And this is how a child received it. You want to know how to read the Bible? You want to know how to understand the Bible? How does a 10-year-old understand it? That's how you should understand it. That's how you're supposed to understand it. I'm going to close my video with Ephesians 5.11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. What you're doing is unfruitful work of darkness. Because it's a lie against the very Christ that has saved us. The very Bible that you inadvertently confess. See, I can do that too. That you inadvertently confess is not the one we've been given today. It's, it's improper. That's that same Bible that told you about Jesus. So if you don't believe the Bible is true, how do you know that Jesus is true? Or are those just the selective scriptures you decided were true, but then the other ones that disagree with your carnal understanding aren't, aren't true, are improperly translated? Good work. You did exactly what the Lord said you were going to do. Deny his word. See, denying his word isn't being an unbeliever. Denying his word is knowing the truth and still denying it and walking away from it. That's what denying his word means. What happens to the people that deny his word? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? happens to the people that deny his word. Let's find out. Huh, this is Bible Way Mac. Let's see.
Open Bible. Perfect. Let's see what happens when you deny God. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Search the hearts and minds. Do you ever man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds? So if you're doing something wrong, you're going to get bad fruit. You're going to get bad thing. Uh, let's see here. John, 1 John 4, 1, good one. Test all the spirits. Let's see. Here we go. Let's try this one. Bible Way Mag. What are the consequences of rejecting God's word? Uh, I hate pop-ups. Let's see here. We are now living in an era where many people believe that they can simply do what they want to do and that is okay. There are no consequences for their actions. But that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible lets us understand that our actions indeed have consequences or blessings. See, consequences can come in a good form or a bad form. Throughout the Bible, there are many examples of nations and people who had forsaken or turned back turn their back on God, and instead walking in their own destructive ways. If you watch the book of Jeremiah playlist, you know what the result was. Even though it seems that they were prospering and God was not seeing their sins, they all eventually faced the consequences of their actions. These examples have taught us that the nation or people who forsake God and goes against the word of God will reap unto themselves destruction. It is not that it is God's will for anyone to be destroyed. However, sin brings with it destruction. The Bible lets us know that there is... There is a way, there's a lot of typos here, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, Proverbs 16.25. So even though what you think is true, doesn't match scripture, it's not true. For man cannot direct his own steps, Jeremiah 10.23, but it is the Lord that directeth his steps, Proverbs 16.9. When we think of a nation or people who forsook the word of God and follow in their own evil ways, most of us will readily think of the children of Israel, God's chosen people. In the book of Jeremiah, we just covered that. I just did a playlist on it. Remember he dedicated two whole chapters to Babylon and what happened? It will be destroyed and uninhabited forever. Still that way to this day. The children of Israel were given the promise by God that if they should obey the word of God all the days of their life, they shall be a prosperous people, a nation that do not borrow masters and not slaves. However, if they should turn their back on God or worship other gods or do evil in the sight of God, then they shall be a cursed people and they will be devoured by the nations around them. Deuteronomy 8, uh, 6 through 20, 27, 15 through 26, and 28, 1 through 68. What did they do? Exactly that. And what happened? Exactly what God said would happen. That does, just doesn't apply to them. It applies to us, too, as believers. You do realize there's a lot of scripture that warns believers not to walk away from the truth. Just like the children of Israel were destroyed when they turned their backs on God, when we walk contrary to the word of God, we are giving Satan and his servants legal rights to put curse of destruction, poverty, or any other curse upon us. Today, there are lessons we can learn from their mistakes and errors, and thereby not making the same mistakes they made. A large part of the Old Testament is written about the apostasy of Israel and other nations and the consequences of such rejection against God. This just proved that God allows us to live as we now choose, sorry, as how we choose, but at the same time, no sins will go unpunished, Ecclesiastes 11, 9 through 12 and 13 through 14. Kind of put that reference in there a little wrong there. The children of Israel were given the promise by God that if they should obey the word of God all the days of their life, they shall be a prosperous people, a nation that will not borrow, master, say, but here, okay, he already covered this. Um, when the children of Israel turned their back on God, God turned his back on them. It is a very sad thing when the Lord turned his back on you, as it leaves you open to many ills. When Not so much he turned his back on him, he took his hand off of him. When God turned his back upon Israel, they became slaves, even in their own country. 2 Kings 24-25. They had to endure harsh economic conditions. The people who the Lord promised they that they would lend to nations and not borrow was not living in poverty, starving, 
and high prices were so rampant that they turned to cannibalism, eating other human beings. Deuteronomy 28, 50, 30, 57, Jeremiah 19, 9, and 2 Kings 6, 26, 29. I strongly believe that one of the main reasons why many countries' economy is going downhill is because of the sins of the people and leaders. I completely agree. I'm going to spare you the lengthiness of this one, but he allowed pestilence and torment them to destroy their crops, brought famine, You okay over there, dog? <laughs> so it's really obvious that you don't believe the Bible is accurately translated by your last statement or second to last statement. It's, pos it's, it's very obvious that you're dealing with this from a very carnal understanding, from your understanding, not God's. You cannot use your understanding and inflict it over onto God's word and say, that's what I believe thereby changing what his word says, which we've covered in some detail, to make it mean something else. When the apostles spoke, Jesus was speaking. Where did the apostles get it from? Not themselves. They got it from him. Because everything he taught, they spoke. Go read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then go read all the other epistles. You'll see many references coming from the same things. They never taught what they believed they never taught what they thought was right. They taught what God told them to teach. So when you read those letters, when they're speaking, he's speaking. That's why I made that reference. Otherwise, God wouldn't have allowed them to do that. God is more powerful than the sum of all his creation. He is capable of doing anything. Can he make it so Jesus has one wife? Sure. Will he? Nope. Because his word says exactly the opposite of that. And we covered that. Ephesians 5, by itself, blows this entire doctrine out of the water. By itself. There is no one bride. No woman that has ever walked this earth, is walking this earth, or will walk this earth, is the singular bride of Christ. Doesn't exist, not ever going to exist. We, as the church of believers, are the bride of Christ, quotations, and the marriage is the rejoining of us with the church. Where's Christ been for 2,000 years? Not, it is, not where his church is. He's in heaven. We're going to be taken to go be with him. That way where he is, we will be there also. Always. Forever. Your lack of understanding on this is why the term stupid fits. Your lack of common sense is why the term stupid, in its original definition, not derogatory, fits. Because you don't understand what you're talking about. You don't understand what these scriptures are saying. And because you don't understand them, instead of learning, instead of trying to understand them, you're going out of your way to make it a more carnal understanding to fit your desires and your lusts to satisfy your flesh, which the Bible said people who didn't believe would do. Now, here's a really serious question. You say you believe, but do you really? See, down here you ask me, do you believe all things are possible with God? I say you should be asking yourself, do I really believe in God? Because if you do, why don't you listen to him? Why don't you do what he says? Why don't you follow his word that he gave us? Do you believe in the Jesus of the Bible or your Jesus? According to your comment, you got your own Jesus because another Jesus was preached, and you're preaching another Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible will not marry one wife and consummate his marriage. The Jesus of the Bible is the creator, the head of the church of believers, and when the rapture happens, we will be brought together. So we will be with him forever. The head joined back to the body. Got it? Clear? Figured it out? See, I have to be adamant about this, and I have to be bold about this. And people may not like some of the speech that I use. Again, understanding. You need understanding and discernment. Understand, when I use a derogatory term that everybody else uses for derogatory, I use it in its actual definition, what it actually means, in its proper context. Somebody who lacks common sense is a stupid person. They lack common sense. That's the very definition of it. You may not like it. That's tough. That's the, that's the proper verbiage. There is no other word that would de uh, exactly and accurately describe what's going on here. You clearly don't know your scriptures. This is, that's evident. That's dangerous for you.
and for all who listen to you. That woman, since you admitted that you're the one that started this, let's see, where was that at? Uh, let's see here. You admitted that right here. Oh, here we go, right here. This paragraph right here. You admit it. You admitted that you started all that. You say literally, I am the one who started all that. Guess what? You get to answer for that. Because if any of the people you've taught that to get lost, that blood is on your hands per scripture. I will require the blood by the watchman's hand if he doesn't warn. See, I have to warn as a watchman. I don't want blood on my hands. I have to. It's my responsibility to warn. And I'm warning you. Stop teaching what you're teaching. Observer of life, stop teaching what you're teaching. You need to spend a little more time in the scripture and less time talking to people. Less time spreading your lies and your deception around because there will be a judgment on you. There will be payment for this. There will be darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth for you if you don't repent, if you don't change. Notice I told the same thing to the other woman. You need to repent. The woman I mentioned in this video, you need to repent. The gal I did the other video I haven't posted yet, she commented very similar things in there. She thinks she's the bride too. Two women on the same video comment thinking they're the bride. I told her, you need to repent. Desperately need to repent. If you can't find it in your heart to do that, then I have nothing to, nothing to do with you. The Bible says expose those things and have nothing to do with them. Avoid them. That's what I'm going to do, what the Bible says. I'd much rather the Lord get all over me for being a jerk than, than for lying to people. Because there's a condemnation, a serious condemnation and a woe for those who lie about God's word. Read it for what it says. Believe it for what it says. If a child, whatever perspective a child gets from that, that's, that's, that's what you're supposed to pay attention to. Because that's the way the Lord presented it. This book is for the common man, not for the thinker. Because once the thinker gets a hold of it, they put all kinds of, their, of stuff in there that they believe. Not true. Absolutely not true. So stop doing that. Anybody else who feels like they want to comment on this and, and put their stupid ideas in here, I'm going to call you out too. I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to, because you speak well, because you, well, just consider it. No. I'm not going to consider what anything man has to offer. I'm going to consider what the Bible says. Because I know that's truth. That's what I rely on. All right, I'm going to get off here. I don't enjoy doing these videos, but they have to be done because people need to know the truth. If we don't warn about this as watchmen, how are people going to know to be aware of this? Somebody will hear this and we go, oh, well, that makes sense. And then shoop, they're gone. I've lost a lot of people on my channel because of this stuff. No, no, absolutely not. Not happening. Absolutely not. We have to stand our ground. Again, God doesn't need people to stand up for him, but he is looking for those who are willing to. And if he gives you a ministry to do that, you better act in that ministry. Again, who, if nobody warns him, who's going to warn him? I am warning observer of life and those other people. You are in a dire situation that I cannot help you out of. You must go to him in repentance. And maybe, hopefully, he'll grant it to you. Because right now you're in a deep, deep, serious sense of lying to yourself and about him. And that's dangerous. That's bad. Don't do that. All right, I'm out of here, guys. Be careful, guys. It's getting worse.